Order. I call this meeting of the Public Accounts Committee meeting to order. This morning we have uh, the Department of Justice with us to discuss maintenance enforcement program, uh, which was actually audited in the May 2018 report of the Auditor General. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone to place their phones on silent. Begin with introductions, starting with Mr. McKay. Good morning and welcome. Hugh McKay, MLA for Chester St. Margaret's. Good morning, Brendan McGuire, Halifax Atlantic. Benjamin Jessam, Hammonds Plains, Lucasville. Good morning, MLA Suzanne Lonis Croft, Lunenburg. Morning, Gordon Wilson, I'm the MLA for Claire Digby. Chris Dontremont, the MLA for Argyle Barrington. Uh, welcome, Dave Wilson, MLA for Sackville Cobbequid. Lisa Roberts, MLA for Halifax Needham. Good morning. Alan McMaster, MLA for Inverness. We have the Auditor General's office with us today. I'll allow Mr. Pickup and uh, his colleague, Ms. Edmonds, to introduce themselves, starting with Ms. Edmonds. Uh, Michelle Edmonds, Audit Principal. Hi, Michael Pickup, Auditor General. And our guests, uh, perhaps we could start on the right. Please introduce yourselves. Thank you. Karen Hudson, Deputy Minister of Justice. Uh, Stephen Feindell, Director of Maintenance Enforcement. Good morning, Kathy Sparling, Senior Manager of the Maintenance Enforcement Program in New Waterford. Ms. Hudson, you may begin with some opening comments. Thank you. Good morning, committee members. Thank you for inviting me to discuss the important work of the Maintenance Enforcement Program. I'm joined by our Director of uh, Maintenance Enforcement, Stephen Feindell, and our Senior Manager, Kathy Sparling. And Stephen and Kathy and I look forward to your questions today. Mr. Chair, the Maintenance Enforcement Program is a free program that helps children and spouses receive court-ordered maintenance. The benefits provide 15,000 families and 14,000 children who rely on this program with an accurate record of payments, a buffer between payors and recipients, and provides enforcement actions if an order falls into arrears. Over the next two hours, we'll share with you the areas where our work is strong and where we are improving. And the message that I'm hoping to share with Nova Scotians today is threefold. One, the maintenance enforcement program is important. It supports the financial and emotional security of Nova Scotians. Two, the maintenance enforcement program has been a priority of this government for the last three years, and significant gains have been made. Three, the program will remain a priority, and we have a plan to do even better. Over the past two decades, our enforcement officers and support staff have collected almost $1.2 billion on behalf of recipients, mostly women and children. The program collects and distributes approximately $230,000 a day, or $5 million a month for families enrolled in the program. And 25 years ago, this program didn't exist. Separated and divorced parents with children were on their own. They had to enforce their own support payments. The government, to its credit, recognized back then the importance of having a program to support children and their families. And so the maintenance enforcement program was established in 1996. And our mandate is to ensure that families who rely on child and spousal support and who have been ordered by the courts to receive it, get it. The program is about providing financial stability for families. And with financial stability comes a path to opportunity and success. And strong families mean strong communities. Payments are often the difference, I say, between surviving and thriving. And here's what we've done better. We are, first of all, collecting more maintenance. In 2017-18, the Auditor General noted that $55 million was sent to recipients. Now, the first quarter of this year, we have collected $15.9 million, which projected out is more than $60 million. Two, outstanding arrears, and by that I mean the arrears that have accumulated since 1996, when the program started, were $73 million in 2015, and they now stand at $58.8 million, the lowest amount in a decade. Three, the number of cases with arrears is also declining. We currently have 5,848 cases. That's down almost 7% from last year. Four, Last year, last fiscal year, there were 23,000 enforcement actions undertaken, and this is a 19% increase in enforcement actions undertaken compared to the prior year. 
Five, we have hired additional staff resources to monitor and enforce orders. Six, we're developing a new online service to increase ability of clients to access information and help from the maintenance enforcement program through their mobile and tablet devices. In August, number seven, we coordinated with the Department of Community Services to ensure that support payments to families on income assistance are no longer clawed back from their income assistance checks. Eight, last year and earlier this year, we proclaimed legislation to strengthen enforcement actions for our enforcement staff. Nine, we also put specific maintenance enforcement metrics into the the Department of Justice's accountability report. And in fact, in the Auditor General's report, he commended the Department and the Maintenance Enforcement Program for this. And 10, our maintenance enforcement staff have a new way of working together. For example, there are short team meetings that are held in the morning and at the end of each day to review the goals that are set for that day and then how those goals have been met or not met and what were the barriers. Mr. Chair, when the Minister of Justice was appointed in 2017, the first thing he said to me was hello, and the second thing he said was, please give me a briefing on the maintenance enforcement program. And that's how important this issue is to him, to the Department, and to the Premier. And the Auditor General's report is welcomed by me and the Department. The six recommendations have been accepted. Essentially, the Auditor General said we can do a better job monitoring and enforcing orders and that we can do a better job training and developing staff. I agree. Specific work continues on the six recommendations from the Auditor General and they will be implemented by the end of this fiscal year. And I'd just like to end by touching on a few specifics. First of all, we have a better policy now to guide staff on how to monitor inactive cases. And an inactive case is one that's not being enforced. And this happens, for example, when a payor is in prison or on income assistance. We have revised the policy and created a new checklist to guide our staff regarding how to monitor and enforce inactive cases. Two, quality assurance. Quality assurance means we have to ensure that our staff are following those policies and checklists. And we have developed an interim schedule of reports that staff must complete, be reviewed by supervisors, and then be provided in uh, feedback. And the final quality assurance process will include random audits. Three, on the issue of the size of caseloads, we have added enforcement officers and a supervisor and an organizational program director who has a black belt in Lean Six Sigma. We continue to work with staff on identifying what we need to watch, what process improvements we can make, and how to give feedback. Four, regarding our response to client complaints, we have set timelines now for response back to clients. And finally, we have focused on a new training program for staff and developing performance targets. Our Senior Manager of Maintenance Enforcement in New Waterford, Kathy Sparling, has an approach, I always say to myself, based on the letter C, communication and clarity. There's a new energy in our Maintenance Enforcement New Waterford office, and one frontline enforcement officer told me recently that things have improved 100%, and her colleagues agreed with that statement. The maintenance enforcement program has made changes. We will continue to improve and we're committed to excellent service. We thank you for this opportunity and we look forward to your questions. Thank you. We'll begin with Mr. Dontremont with the PC caucus for 20 minutes. Thank you very much and thanks for, uh, for being in here to answer our questions. Uh, I know as an MLA quite often, um, I'm going to say it's a lot a month, but you know, once a month or so, we're getting phone calls from uh, individuals who uh, are, are not getting their payment for the most part. Um, so, you know, some of our questions as we move along will we'll sort of go around the job uh, of an MLA and how we should interact uh, with you. But let's get started in the beginning. So, you know, we had asked the same question of the Auditor General just earlier. You know, when was the department made aware uh, of the audit? Uh, and uh, and uh, when do you f when do you feel the audit began for you? So you're starting to get work together. When did when did that start for you? 
Ms. Hudson. Thank you. Um, I believe, and I stand to be corrected uh, by my uh, colleagues here today, I believe that it began in uh, 2016 um, and uh, that uh, that's when the work commenced and that the files that were pulled by the Auditor General for review were over the year of 2016 and into the fall of 2017. Okay, the audit covers from April 1st, 2015 to September 30th, 2017. So a, a pretty big uh, a big area to, just to see what the trends and stuff are going to, to do. When did the department receive the recommendations from the Auditor General? So we received the recommendations from the Auditor General in the um, spring of 2018, um, close to um, the, um, the end of the May date when they were uh, published. But, so we had a review of them uh, a, a while earlier before that. Okay. We, I would suggest you probably got it around the fe in February, somewhere sort towards yes, the mid. Yes, like an interim report yeah. review, but the final report uh, right. came out in May. Yeah, we we all get it on the. Yes. I think it was May 18th in this in this particular case. Um, so, if it, it was February, uh, and the senior management of the department has it by that point, uh, were you able to use that information to? help with your budgeting because uh, as because we know we're in the full budget process and that point so if they identify issues um, were you able to use that information to maybe lobby the central government for more money uh, for maintenance enforcement what we did with respect to the um, the information that we received in a draft form with the chance to provide input in uh, early in the spring and for before the final report was use that information to help shape and give more context and more direction with respect to the areas that we were improving. In terms of specifically with respect to um, budget requests, um, what we had in the last fiscal year was uh, five new positions being put in into the maintenance enforcement program. We needed to continue to see what use and the best use of those five positions. We were at the time when those five positions were authorized in terms of the budget in 2017-18. Um, we were in the process of filling those uh, positions in the 2017-18 year. So early in 2018, we needed to see, are those the right positions in the right place doing the right thing? So in terms of making further requests for budget influx into the maintenance enforcement program, we needed to see what use and effect was being made of the resources and a significant resource um, influx that uh, government gave in the 2017-18 year. Mr. Feindel, anything else? Uh -huh. Mr. Feindel? Yes, the only thing I would add is that uh, we were approved for uh, 1.2 roughly million dollars to uh, uh, invest in IT and improvements to the technologies uh, utilized by our clients uh, for the 18-19 uh, fiscal year. So that was part of the budget process as well, and that was in, in anticipation of trying to respond uh, to uh, feedback that we'd had from our clients, but also being proactive uh, around trying to improve the client service side of things. Um, so this year you've budgeted $900,000. Uh, did the additional budget allocation, I would say, before or after the department was made aware of those AG recommendations? And there's 900 showing on showing on the, in the books for, for, for this year. So I don't know where the 1.2 comes from, but there's 900 showing that. So, Ms. Hudson? Thank you. So yes, in terms of the uh, uh, $1.2 million in terms of investment in IT, that is for this current fiscal year. The maintenance enforcement program has had an online accessibility for clients for a few years. However, we know that there is needed to be upgrades for that online process and um, support for payors and recipients. We were very pleased that in this fiscal year that the government did um, give the uh, um, uh, increase in terms of the $1.2 million so that uh, by um, the end of this fiscal year that we are currently in, so by April 1st of 2019, that we will have a platform um, that better supports Nova Scotians in terms of their interaction with the maintenance enforcement program. And we're doing a very interesting thing in terms of developing um, the ability of Nova Scotians to get the information, to give the um, information, to receive the help that they need from the maintenance enforcement program. And we are working with clients to help develop what sort of online 
aspects are most relevant and easily used by them. So this client consultation approach that we are using regarding that new influx of resources um, is quite exciting for us this year. Um, just last question on budget. Uh, the budget for maintenance enforcement has been slated to increase since 2014-15, uh, but in terms of actual spending, it's only up about, about 300,000 in that time. Uh, 3.2 million in 2014, 3.5 million in 2017, 18. So every year during that time, there's been a budget increase that have never been realized. Uh, we're almost halfway through that year. What are your expenditures to date, and will the program see the full 4.4 million dollar uh, that's being budgeted by technology and staffing? Uh, are you going to be able to be full complement by that point? Yes, so I will, I will start and then I'll ask Mr. Feindel to uh, follow up on anything that I've missed. Uh, we do expect to expand the, um, the budget allocation for this year. In terms of the IT, we do expect that that will be um, uh, spent. We are underway, we are planning, we are spending, we are developing the IT um, needs to better meet Nova Scotians. In terms of the prior year where there was an influx of resources uh, to uh, come into five additional resources for the maintenance enforcement program. It does take some time to recruit and uh, select and hire into those positions. Thirdly, from time to time, there are um, people that do leave the program in terms of staff, and then those positions have to be posted and hired. So sometimes there are vacancy savings, if you will, that in terms of uh, um, um, savings that are not being able to be utilized because there is a process that needs to be followed to uh, rehire into a vacant position. But uh, we are accelerating our use of the uh, good funds that the uh, government has put into the program program with respect to um, ongoing operational expenses and the new um, funds this year for IT. Mr. Feindel? Mr. Feindel? Sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, the only other thing I would add is that you know, my mandate, I've joined uh, the program back in March and uh, been there about six months and my mandate is to make sure that we are making the improvements that are necessary there for the program and uh, my approach is to leave no stone unturned in terms of the resources that we have available uh, to uh, the program and the team there and that involves making sure we make maximum use of the positions that we have and the funding that we have to uh, make the program at the best it can be. Um, so let's go to the report itself. There's 600 recommendations from the report. Uh, one's complete, one is scheduled to be complete by the middle of December. The remaining are scheduled by the end of fiscal year. Uh, the already completed recommendations set complaint responses to three days for routine complaints. 10 days for complaints from uh, the director, ombudsman, or an MLA, and 20 days for a complex legal case. Well, why are there different standards, and maybe can you explain around uh, what's the difference between the three? Mr. Feindel? Uh, sure, and I'll have um, our Kathy Sparling jump in here because she deals with uh, a lot of these every day. Um, but generally speaking, we have uh, complaints that come in where perhaps a uh, recipient or client is looking for uh, the status of a payment and they're complaining that they're not getting a response on that. Uh, those, would, uh, those types of uh, complaints would be uh, considered to be a routine standard. We can get that information back to them pretty quickly. Uh, we might have to uh, make sure that we talk to the enforcement officer to get the updated information and have them contact. Um, when we have a, um, you know, a, an inquiry, whether it's from MLA or perhaps a, a complaint to the director of the program, those tend to be a little bit more um, uh, complicated and require a little bit more, I'll say, investigation to kind of see what's, uh, what's happening with the case, looking at the, at the record uh, of activities. And um, so, you know, and these, by the way, these uh, targets that we've set are initial targets and we're evaluating whether they're appropriate or not. Obviously, we want to resolve complaints in the most timely fashion uh, possible. Um, and then in the complex um, and legal cases, there, um, as you can appreciate, some fairly um, uh, complicated situations that some of our clients can get into, uh, sometimes involving other jurisdictions. Um, you know, the uh, complications around perhaps the enforcement activities that are happening on that particular case. And uh, we 
uh, often need to perhaps ask for legal uh, support around those, and that's why uh, some of those more complicated cases take a few uh, a longer period of time to resolve. And Kathy, perhaps I'll ask you to kind of jump in with some experience on some of those actual cases. Ms. Sperling. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, yes, um, this was a great opportunity to enhance the complaint response um, to the program from clients, MLAs, and complex cases is what, where we were able to identify the segregation of when a complaint comes in. With um, the uh, increase of staff or development manager and a new coordinator, um, which gave us uh, further opportunity to improve uh, IT enhancements, which we can now do reports running and respond to where, and we were able to in our MEP system identify when a complaint is made, when one is in progress, and when we're able to close it. So we can clearly pull out those complaints. And we, we meet as a team, as manager team, every morning to review the report on what we have for today, where are we with ongoing complaints, and when a complaint's closed. And it's also to look for trends on where areas of opportunity to work and develop our staff, whether it be in training, uh, new staff, and where we can uh, focus on making improvements to the program. I can say 10 days for MLAs. I deal a lot with some of the MLAs here, so it's nice to see you. Um, we do 10 days because our first response is to receive an MLA inquiry slash complaint. Um, and it may not be a complaint, it may just be an inquiry, and then we would circle back to the MLA because our, our priority would be to respond to the client to find out what, what uh, the concern is with the program. And complex cases is exactly what it says. It could be a court order that can be very complicated in how it is being, how it's written and how we are able to enforce it. Uh, so then we do move to legal if necessary to get some advice there. Um, so again, IT improvements or development manager, new coordinator, all of that uh, has helped and improved. And I have to say that it's also supporting our staff and our people on the ground who are working with this every day it can be very challenging. So we do have some support mechanisms in place so where we can work with the, the enforcement officers and assistants to attend to some of these as clients can be, it can become very challenging. I hope that answers, Mr. Speaker. Oh, that, that, uh, that, that does help uh, quite a bit. Um, I, I can say I, I've been in MLA for 16 years and I've had like multiple people that have been responsible for, for uh, enforcement or MEP. Um, and I don't have your phone number, so after this, can we have your phone number? Uh, the, the Liberals on the table here might have your number. I, um, I don't necessarily have that. I just don't want to do it in the public, uh, in the public forum. No problem. Mr. Speaker, may I? Mr. We do Chair. have a list that's distributed to all MLAs with all of our phone numbers, and I'll ensure that if you did not get that, that you will. Thank you. Um, so the case uh, work uh, from the numbers that we're, we're, we're looking at uh, are from about 330 to about 400 cases per uh, worker. So assuming that most maintenance payments are monthly, uh, they could be working on 22 cases a day, uh, any sense to an optimum caseload level? I mean, that's a lot of work for a few people. Ms. Hudson. So with respect to uh, the caseload, and as you said, uh, they've been reported to be between 330 and uh, basically about 450 uh, per enforcement officer. First of all, we are at now at our full complement of enforcement officers. Uh, secondly, we are now at our uh, full complement and very excited about that with respect to uh, the, the supervisors, i.e. the coordinators. So we have three of those. The coordinators review and give feedback to the enforcement officers. In terms of fourthly or thirdly, um, what we have done in terms of other than increasing staff resources and focusing on how those staff do their job and support each other, we have made changes regarding the way in which those staff numbers do their job. So we have moved into a tiered service model. And what I mean by that is that not every case is the same and you can't simply look at uh, one case and say that that is comparable to the amount of work that needs to be done compared to another case. So a tiered service model means, for example, that we have enforcement assistance using a proportionality lens, enforcement assistance that now monitor those cases that are 
they're in full compliance, whereas we use the enforcement officers to be looking at the monitoring and enforcement of the more complex cases. And then within the enforcement officer continuum, and we have 10 of those, the way in which in the type of caseload that they have. So we have some enforcement officers, and, are, and this is a new model for us, and we're adjusting it, but ensuring that some enforcement officers will have a focus on more of the complex cases where there are complexities because of multiple payors, where there might be complexities in other caseloads because of persistent arrear situations. Um, so we are looking at the way in which uh, the enforcement officers do their caseload, and not every enforcement officer has the same type of caseload, are the changes that we have uh, put into place um, just over the last few months and are quite excited about this because we are getting the feedback from our enforcement officers and our enforcement assistants that this is making sense to them. It is a better way for them to manage overall caseloads and not every enforcement officer now has the same degree of caseload or the same complexity of that caseload. So we have increased resources in terms of the number of supervisors. We have increased resources in terms of the number of enforcement officers, and we have gone into a proportional, i.e. tiered model. And I would ask if uh, Mr. Feindel, uh, Mr. Chair, has anything to add. Mr. Feindel. Um, the, the number of cases for each uh, uh, enforcement officer is certainly an area of ongoing focus uh, in the team. Um, you know, the question of too high, it, the answer is it really depends on the number, the types of cases that are being managed by that enforcement officer, as the deputy has pointed out. Uh, if it's uh, a, you know, a case that's in compliance and the payments are happening, we can, we can have a, a higher caseload. If it's uh, requiring a lot of enforcement activities, uh, things like uh, examination, or uh, court actions that have to be taken, that obviously a caseload of, of a high number is not uh, sustainable. So we're looking at that uh, ongoing and making sure that the types of cases uh, that are assigned to the, to the enforcement officers are appropriate. And as has been referenced, we have a service model that has that progression through our enforcement continuum where uh, the focus on the cases uh, that need that higher level of enforcement activity is perhaps rebalanced and looked at on an ongoing basis basis within the team there and uh, we do that uh, uh, as I say ongoing and often as part of our productivity meetings and um, you know that's an ongoing piece that we are t attention to the um, the other comment I would make is that talking to my colleagues across the country there is a wide uh, variation of the number of caseloads it's dependent on things like how much automation is in your your system that assist the uh, the caseworkers with being able to do their uh, their activities uh, and it also depends on the individual profiles of those those cases, the types of enforcement activities that are necessary. So uh, there's no magic number in terms of what the right number is, but over time we hope to establish those benchmarks so that we're not uh, running folks too hard, that we're providing the right level of client service um, in terms of looking after those cases and getting the money in the hands of recipients and uh, basically doing that with the quality assurance measures that we're instituting on an ongoing basis basis as well. Uh, the department stated that they're collecting 87% of payments. Uh, any sense of how many caseloads of that caseload are trouble free, that there's no follow-up required, or is there a certain percentage that don't require monitoring at all, or do you monitor everything just to be sure? We obviously monitor everything uh, to, uh, and, and there's mechanisms in our case system to be able to keep track of all of our cases. Um, and we're doing a better job at making sure that those mechanisms are being used. But in terms of the, um, the actual number of cases that are in full compliance, it's around 87% uh, of our cases are uh, in full compliance or they have uh, some, le there are some uh, payers that prefer to have a garnishment in place to actually make the payments uh, happen, so that 87% would include cases like that. And we have uh, reports that come out of our system to let us know if, the, if any of those payers go into default, so then they're flagged for further follow-up. Order, time has expired. We'll move to the NDP caucus and Ms. Roberts. 
Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. And certainly, I appreciate that this is is one of the programs in Nova Scotia that where you know the work of of everybody with the maintenance enforcement program has a huge impact on uh, citizens' lives. So I, I appreciate the all the efforts to improve it. Um, do, do you know? Uh, you know, obviously, sometimes uh, you know people who have children together or people who used to be in relationships, sometimes they arrive at maintenance agreements independently and sometimes they're ordered by the court. How do you receive maintenance? Uh, how do the cases come to you in those, in those different circumstances? Is it, you know, they hear about it somehow through the public that there's this option? Is it that when there's a court order, it automatically goes to maintenance enforcement? Ms. Hudson. Thank you. And uh, I will ask uh, Ms. Sparling to uh, give some more detail on that. In terms of uh, how the cases come into us, um, either the payor or the recipient uh, um, can enroll in the maintenance enforcement program. What we are looking at now is and how you enroll, um, and the questions about that are on our website. But what we are looking at right now is making it even easier for people to understand the benefits of enrolling in the maintenance enforcement program and also how we can make that enrollment process even easier and more fluid and more use of technology to do all of the enrollment. So we're looking at things such as the uh, number of forms that people might have to fill out if they uh, wish to enroll and how often uh, we actually do a check back with them. So one of the things that I've heard from our people is an idea that they have rather than if somebody contacts I would like to enroll and just sending them uh, the forms, that we actually think about doing a reach back, i.e. a call to them in terms of if they have a question. Because sometimes forms can be hard for people to understand. We think that they're plain language, but they're not plain language sufficiently. So in terms of how you enroll uh, or how we get the orders, people have to enroll. It can be either the recipient or the payor. We are looking at how we can do a better job supporting people to do the enrollment process. And then finally, uh, what we are looking at too is with respect to uh, the issues of getting it better known to Nova Scotians about the program. So how we can brand the maintenance enforcement program for Nova Scotians. I mean, right now, currently, we are talking about 15,000 families um, and 14,000 children and uh, there's a significant amount of maintenance that uh, comes in and is enforced and goes out. As I said, $230,000 a day projecting $60 million this year. But secondly, how can we do a better job of making the maintenance enforcement program known to even more Nova Scotians? So with that, we are working with maintenance enforcement and our court services division to focus in terms of, you know, when anybody is in court and they are getting uh, an order or varying an order, that those people, our staff in the courthouse, are also aware and understand the maintenance enforcement program that is not in the courthouse. So we are working in terms of uh, branding and making it better known to Nova Scotians. If you don't mind, I'll just move on to uh, another question, but I, I appreciate that. And certainly one of, um, you know, I think one of the reasons that it is so important that these improvements get made is because it gives people confidence that it makes sense to enroll in the program. Because nobody wants to enroll in a program if they feel like it's not going to work for them. Um, but certainly, I think I think any relationship that has broken down can benefit from having somebody else tracking the money uh, that, you know, that, that financial piece of the relationship that continues beyond the beyond the date when the relationship is is amicable and intact. Um, the the Auditor General reviewed 25 cases where it was expected that the maintenance enforcement program would have taken enforcement action to collect outstanding payments and, and found that appropriate action was either not taken or was taken later than it should have been in 21 cases. Can, can you speak to what led to action not being taken in those cases and, and how, which of the improvements that you're talking about today has actually improved that situation so that um, that won't be the case moving forward? Yes, certainly. 
Um, I will uh, start uh, with respect to, um, you know, receiving the Auditor General's report. And I always look at uh, reports such as this as a really great opportunity to have an independent person have a look at a program and uh, give advice and help shape um, how we should be going forward. With respect to uh, the enforcement actions, one of the things that uh, became clear from uh, um, reviewing the Auditor General's report, reviewing the findings, and then taking a hard look at ourselves is that we need to better use automation and feedback in terms of management feedback uh, from the management level. So one of the things that we have done regarding enforcement actions is looking at um, using a bring forward and automated system for our enforcement officers to be reminded that you must look at this case now and uh, have you considered this type of enforcement enforcement on the enforcement continuum before the automation was really left to the enforcement officers individually to set reminders to themselves about when to look at a case, when to consider what the next step would be in that case. So what we have done and what we are continuing to work on in terms of our dashboard for management and enforcement staff is looking at using the IT that is going to be a system IT that, okay, here's a, you know this day of uh, October 17th and I'm an enforcement officer and what is going to come up on my screen today of all of my cases that I should be looking at today and not dependent on me if I'm an enforcement officer having hopefully set something to be reminded. So we are looking at a system automation, a dashboard if you will, to assist our enforcement officers in looking at and considering the next step in the right way. We've also done more training about the enforcement options that are now available through the strength and legislation legislation. We have nine videos that we have uh, in terms of training modules, um, aside from all of the new training that has been done on these new enforcement tools, we have uh, developed, I believe, nine um, training videos for staff in terms of how you do this, when you should do this. So looking at better training, better oversight, the management looking at reports and giving feedback as opposed to just receiving a report and not giving feedback and uh, using automation. Um, I would ask if, if Mr. Feindel. Mr. Feindel. There's really three areas to make sure that we're monitoring. So the results were disappointing to us as well, uh, you know, I'll say. And, and so we looked at uh, the reasons for why we had some of those uh, challenges with those cases. So those cases that were reviewed by the Auditor General, we jumped on right away and made sure that they were obviously up to date. But uh, we've been spending the last uh, number of weeks and months uh, looking at all of our other caseloads. And I'll give you an example of where I think the Auditor General pointed out that we weren't making uh, great use of our, uh, or as good a use as we could for the bring forward capability in our case management system. And we found actually that when cases were moved from one enforcement to an officer to another, uh, the BFs, uh, the uh, bring forwards were actually not carried with those. So that actually was one of the reasons why uh, some of the case monitoring wasn't happening in the way that it should. So we've corrected things like that. And we now have a sort of a three-pronged approach with, you know, training the staff better uh, around and support supporting them more, uh, adjusting the caseloads where we need to, making sure that we do have a, a renewed approach to quality assurance, and that our productivity uh, reporting around the way the cases are being managed. And the deputy made reference to uh, the daily stand-up meetings that we have in the morning and the afternoon. The, um, you know, the enforcement officers are themselves setting goals for the day in terms of the number of case calls and, and uh, bring forwards and call returns that they're going to make. And then they're reviewing those at the end of the day, and that's brought a real focus and uh, communication around the team, supporting one another um, when we find, and having coordinators now uh, staffed appropriately is uh, providing a level of oversight to that. So we think we're on a much better path to make sure that the quality of monitoring those cases is in a much better place than it perhaps has been. Um, I think... You know, there, there's a number of different metrics that were used in the Auditor General's report that you are tracking, I think, for, for individuals who are who are relying on the maintenance enforcement program. I think the, the most significant metric that they're looking at is what is the time lag between when they get an order or, you know, they, there's an agreement made that they're going to get a certain amount of money 
in a month to when that money actually starts to flow into their bank account. And I'm wondering how you're tracking that. And this is a question very much motivated by a constituent who, you know, was assigned a maintenance enforcement worker in December, and she has not yet received the money. And and so I'm 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 interested to know, like, is there is there uh, something that you're tracking in terms of that time lag between assignment of an officer and um, money starting to flow to the to the payee? Yeah, so absolutely is the answer to that. The, you know, the time clock ticks when the court order has been issued. And uh, so the time it takes to get that court order in our system, get the enrollment package out, uh, get it through our intake uh, process uh, where we look at the, is there some initial enforcement that needs to be done? Um, those are all critical time points. And I think uh, we're not where we need to be yet with some of those uh, pieces, but we know that that's a critical stage because if there's arrears already owing by the time we start to administer the payments on that, that, uh, that court order, um, then you're behind the eight ball already, not only for the recipient, but for our management of the file. So we know that's super critical, and actually we've made a number of improvements around our intake function so that we assess the file, make sure that appropriate enforcement activities are put in place as early as possible, as we know that makes a difference. And, um, you know, making sure that uh, we have that follow through on the monitoring of that file in the early stages uh, to make sure that those payments are happening. Uh, we are also looking at, you know, that we want the profile of how much administrative overhead the program adds to passing payments to the recipients to be as low as possible. And so things like uh, how long we might be holding on, we get a lot of checks from payers, and we uh, actually have reduced by 50% the amount of time that we hold any funds because of checks that we receive, making sure the funds are there before we pass them along. And so over the last few months, we've reduced that by 50%, and we plan to do more around that. And so again, because I am sort of motivated by this particular uh, mm -hmm. case, um, should I be surprised that it is nine months between, you know, assignment of a maintenance enforcement uh, officer and, and recipient of first payment? I'll ask uh, Kathy Sparling to maybe jump in and ask or answer that question for Ms. you. Ms. Sparling. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, um, it, it is one of the uh, priorities uh, for myself as a senior management manager on the ground, and we have made improvements from enrollment to intake. Um, for example, um, finding an income source as soon as possible, and sometimes that becomes the challenge, is actually being able to attach to an income source. One of the things we have uh, to delay the time from uh, enforcement would be an intake officer. We've, in, we've added another enforcement officer to that tier in the structure model to ensure that we're taking action immediately rather than waiting for it to be transferred into another caseload, so another enforcement officer or has to do the same reviewing. So for example, the legislation improvements may be a motor vehicle infraction or revocation that can be started right at intake. And that's one of the improvements that we're making as opposed to waiting it, and the legislation has allowed us to do that more uh, efficiently. So we are taking actions to that effect. I do encourage um, when there's challenges, uh, nine months is way too long for someone to wait. I, to I agree, and I encourage that person to contact me. Um, and there may be some barriers that are preventing us from attaching to money uh, an income source. Can, can I ask, um, when, when the payor is a federal government employee, um, I mean, obviously there, there are different situations and different levels of complications depending on income sources, but federal government employee seems to me should be pretty straightforward. Patch garnishment, yes. Um, Mr. Chair, um, agree. I'm not, I, I can't, I would like to be able to speak to that case a little bit maybe yeah. <laughs> after the fact, yeah. but um, we have made improvements. It is recognized from um, one of the things is the mindset and the goal is to when um, parties walk out of a courthouse and there is a court order, the payer knows he's responsible to pay when immediately on the date it says in the order and our goal is to achieve, to get that uh, rolling and moving and, inf and immediately, and hopefully that can be uh, in our current caseload where a payer is making payments regularly on time without any enforcement actions. And I do say we have, I believe it's 52% of our cases that do do that, and that's the goal. So I hope that answers. 
Okay. Thank you. I'm, I am going to move on to something else, and, and I will follow up with you. Um, the information uh, provided shows that uh, almost 15,000 children were served by the program, and it also notes that in as of January 2017, there were a number of children not counted in cases where money is owed to the government of Nova Scotia, um, for example, for arrears owed to the Department of Community Services. So I'm, I am wondering um, if you can describe in what circumstances would child support money be collected, be enforced to be collected, uh, where the money would go to the province rather than to the child? Ms. Hudson. So um, I'll start and ask uh, Mr. Chairs for uh, Mr. Feindel to uh, follow up. So uh, with respect uh, to uh, the changes that have been made uh, this past summer, and uh, they are uh, quite exciting changes uh, with respect to uh, um, when the uh, recipient is um, on income assistance uh, before uh, the uh, change was made, the, any maintenance that was collected um, was uh, um, s um, deducted off of the income assistance check of the recipient. And uh, now that has uh, changed, and that is good. And in terms of it not being clawed back or deducted off of the income assistance check. We expect that uh, this will see about $3 million more flow through to recipients uh, per year. And uh, so that is a significant uh, amount of money uh, for uh, those most vulnerable um, of our recipients. And as has been said before, um, the vast majority of recipients are women. And in terms of talking about income assistance, um, we are talking about the most vulnerable women and children in our society. So it is a good thing now that uh, that uh, income, uh, that maintenance, will not be deducted off the income assistance checks. And I would ask if Mr. Feindel can uh, give you more specifics regarding your question. Mr. Feindel. Yes, yeah, so the, when the uh, recipient is on income assistance, uh, they, uh, community services entered in and the recipient enter into an assignment of maintenance agreement, it's called. And uh, so that assignment of maintenance actually is the recipient agreeing that those maintenance payments uh, through the court order are assigned to uh, community services because they become part of, they were up until August 1st, considered part of uh, their uh, income assistance payment, right? So um, th those assignment of maintenances are tracked in our system and basically you can have two types, one where the payer is paying and that money goes to DCS because it's being then passed on as part of the uh, payment to the recipient in their income assistance. And if it's arrears uh, and, and those payments aren't coming in, those arrears accrue to, uh, to community services. And so up until August 1st, that's how that was after August 1st on a go forward, uh, the payment payments are made to the recipient. Uh. Um, I'm sorry, I only have two minutes left. Uh, it, I think it would be very interesting to enter, you know, to, to, to engage in a, in a discussion with those parents that are in arrears now that that policy has changed, um, you know, to create some kind of a carrot as well as a stick or, or something so that you know, I think I think for many payers, um, knowing that you're paying back a debt to the province is a very different emotional uh, um, emotion laden decision versus I'm going to get I'm going to I'm going to you know settle up with my kid. Um, so it would be it would be nice to see some sort of conversation going forward about how we can you know get people into compliance to the direct benefit of their children. Oh. Uh, Ms. Hudson. Certainly. Um, two things. One, we are focusing on having a client advisory feedback, so a process that lets us speak with our clients. Secondly, to your point, uh, we agree the studies that we have seen um, do show that uh, um, when payors know that their money is going into uh, um, the their, their family, um, there is an increased likelihood of payment. So um, it is a win-win situation, and I did want you to know that uh, we have begun a process of formally reaching out to and interacting with our clients to see if uh, our services are making sense to them and uh, how they can be improved. Uh, 
Last quick question. Um, the AG report mentioned issues with staff absenteeism and extended leaves. Are you able to provide us with any, any data um, on sick leave or short-term disability among, among staff at the maintenance enforcement program, and, and has it changed over time? So I will, I will start. Um, with respect to absenteeism and overall with respect to employee engagement, as I said in my opening remarks, and this comes from our maintenance enforcement colleagues, um, they see a new energy, a new way of doing things. They are much more engaged um, than uh, when I was there. Um, Two years ago, it was a different vibe when I walked into the uh, new Waterford office. The staff themselves have said that uh, um, they do not see the same issues. They said 100% improvement, and that includes employee engagement. There are always going to be issues of, of, of absenteeism, of illness, of short-term illness, of long-term illness, but we have done a better job of filling vacancies, as Mr. Feindel said, when those come up. No I'm sorry, time has expired. We'll move to the Liberal Caucus, Ms. Lonis Croft. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it's good to have you here. Um, uh, maintenance enforcement is um, certainly a topic that we MLAs do, do hear a fair amount about, and, and they're very complex cases, I must say. Some um, even involve multiple pays, um, which I'm finding. Um, when it's not part of your world, it, it's quite an eye-opener with the um, lifestyles that some children are exposed to and, and whatnot. Um, I want to talk about the move to New Waterford because um, according to the AG's report, and I think we've all heard it, um, it impacted the services. So um, I think a lot of it was uh, staff did not care to go um, move, live, you know, um, move to New Waterford. So you had to hire new staff. Um, I'm wondering, uh, were, what are the qualifications for your staff? You have different levels. You said supervisors. You have enforcement officers. You have assistants to enforcement officers. What are the qualifications for staff at enforcement? Ms. Hudson? Yes, I would ask if Ms. Sparling could provide the specific specifics. Thank you. Ms. Sparling. Thank you. Um, for an enforcement officer, the um, high, we, we look for somebody that manages a high volume of case management experience, some financial um, experience background because they are um, managing money not uh, per se in hand, but court orders. So they do... Um, ensure that they have some financial background uh, managing and working with clients. Um, but one of the, the biggest factors is the ability to manage uh, high volume case management experience, meaning um, bring forward systems, productivity reports, working with clients. And what makes it unique to maintenance enforcement in case management, it's two people on every file. So you are responsible to manage two sides of a file, payer and recipient. So high conflict ability to manage and work with people as well as respond to a team environment. And what kind of secondary education? Uh, we look for um, educate post. It would be a um, post-secondary. A degree is one of the qualifications, but with you may also have uh, experience that could match that. So somebody within our system, it's a unionized environment. We could have somebody that has worked as a conciliator for 10 or 15 years, may not have a degree, but they would certainly be qualified to apply for the position as an enforcement officer. Okay, and the assistant enforcer? The like assistant would be um, at a clerical uh, background. They may have a business diploma, a community services background. We do have people that have degrees that apply for that position. Um, we've had some great success with succession management in our program in the last three years, uh, which has helped with retention. Um, we talk about attendance and absenteeism, so we have... Um, provided the enforcement assistance the ability to learn case management skills uh, on the job by taking, uh, by working the um, files that are current where no enforcement action is in place and uh, reciprocal jurisdiction files where the payer is in another jurisdiction that's being forced there. So they have, uh, they're developing great skills in the last year we've been following this um, procedure and it's been working very well. So they came in with uh, administrative uh, skills as they're answering phones. Some, some of our workers come from call centers 
because they do manage the uh, client service line. So I, if that answers your question. Okay, so no one has a social work background or community service background at all because, you know, I, I, I know it, it falls under the Department of Justice, but um, many of these people are serviced by community services and social workers. Uh, it's interesting uh, you say that. A social work background isn't the first to go to, um, no. Um, but a lot of the skills are... Um, we will, a lot of our client workers will have those types of skills working in other departments. If you come from a case management experience in DCS and you do come to MEP, you will have that. So it's more, um, we're there to do more of a referral if somebody is more needing that type of um, attention. Mm -hmm. So our focus is mainly on um, receive, getting the money to the recipient, so it's an enforcement. So if there is um, an area where a client is needing more, uh, we're very good to, we do case uh, reviews three times a week with, if there's a challenge, and, and we have coordinators that are there on hands-on for clients that need that. So an enforcement officer isn't spending a lot of time having to manage what isn't part of the role of their uh, position. Okay. And, and the... The Auditor General also remarked that there was a, a lack of training or no training and, and um, PD. Um, so um, can you talk to me what you, about what you're doing to improve on that? Um, are you having performance reviews now? Um, yes, that was definitely a challenge, was training. We do have, um, with one of our added positions, the org development manager has, is uh, also uh, one of her uh, qualifications when you, we didn't get to that position, but uh, is training. And so we've developed some of the great tools that we have now are to ensure the consistency that we do do peer-on-peer um, -peer training, more or less. Um, but we do have video um, that we do create so all staff are receiving the same type of training on specific um, procedures on our system. So we have 12 videos right now that are great and you can go to it any time to review so new staff can have that. Or if you're changing your role and what position you are working on, you can have the videos. We, do, um, we also do a training room where we do court order once a week. We have a weekly court order entry support um, provided to all staff. So if you're new and you're learning how to um, um, read a court order or enter it on our system, we have a support once a week where you can come in and there's two enforcement officers and a coordinator available to support staff to do that. So it's consistent, it's weekly. Uh, we do one-on-one uh, -on -one meetings with staff, we do productivity reports, and then we do individual meetings with their coordinator to identify areas and opportunities of training. Uh, we use the PSC training that's available. Um, we do... Um, uh, other types of training in our training room, crisis calls. We had an, um, an enforcement officer that is um, taking a, a higher education, took this training, and, and she then um, brought it to her peers. Okay. Uh, we do have a program that has been developed, a package that has been de developed for training, consistent, and it's um, being rolled out now as we speak, and in December 2018 is our goal. So yes, we'll have consistency, and training is a high priority for the program. So most of your, your clients contact you through telephone? I'm assuming um, your walk-in would be limited. Ms. Hudson? Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I'll start and ask uh, Ms. Uh, Sparling to uh, um, also answer. Um, yes, uh, there are two uh, methods of contact. Uh, telephone, there are a lot of telephone calls and also um, um, with respect to online, we do uh, receive some letters but not as many with respect to that. In terms of the client contact, we have seen an increase from about 44,000 uh, contacts into the MEP program um, from clients uh, two years ago to last Last year going up to more than 48,000 client contacts. So there are a lot of client contacts uh, coming in. We are looking at trying to make it easier and clearer for how clients uh, can get information so that they do not need to call in, that they can get that information, they can get it at 8 o'clock at night as opposed to um, having to make a call during business hours. So that is why we're focusing on increasing the IT side of it
it for clients. Um, we have an interactive uh, uh, voice messaging system now where uh, clients can call in to their enforcement officer and uh, leave specific uh, uh, information that they are requesting and we do track the calls that come in and when they need to be returned. And uh, that is a difference in our approach. But I did want you to know that uh, the number of client contacts have uh, increased. The Auditor General noted that. Uh, from two years ago, they went up from about 24,000 to uh, the last year to about 48,000. So there has been a significant increase in client contact. And hopefully part of that is because people do understand a little bit better than they did a few years ago about the benefits of being in the program. Um, if Ms. Sparling has anything else to add. Mr. Sparling. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we do have many ways into the program, IVR, correspondence, NSMEP, fax, uh, and our client service line. We play, pay close attention to all, um, and we do uh, ensure that we, uh, on our bring it and leave it boards, where we have our goals for the day, it's what's outstanding, in the morning and what's done by the end of the day to ensure that we do respond to all of the clients. Mm -hmm. One of the things we're very excited about is the MEP Online IT Enhancement to allow all Nova Scotians in our program the ability to reach out on their own if need be. Some of what may be, um, we do think too it's going to free up some of the time for the enforcement officers and assistants to attend to the cases uh, that need their attention as opposed to some clients having to call because they don't have, they have an Apple um, product and they're not able to access our system. So that is going to be a huge um, improvement and to so people are able to access on their own. Uh, to clarify, we don't have a walk-in service, like we don't oh, respond okay. to, so just um, to clarify that. So the opportunity for the IT people, have there's an app for that. So if you want to be able to access on your own to identify all of the different people, we will always be able to respond to those that would prefer a live voice and to call, mm -hmm. but there's going to be a generation where they want to be able to respond and our IT improvements should be up to date to respond to the clients that want to use that app service. And Deputy, I think you mentioned about the filling out of the forms. Um, earlier, and that's one thing I have noticed as an MLA. Well, I, I've, I've been aware of it because I'm an educator too. The large number of people who are illiterate, and we don't fully understand literacy here um, in general. We think because someone can write their name that they are literate, but comprehension is the essence of being literate. And numerous, numerous constituents come in, not just not just for these issues, but, you know, just to fill out heating rebate forms. There are a large number of people, especially in rural Nova Scotia, who cannot fill out and comprehend the forms. So what do you do to help these people where everything seems to be online or on telephone? Um, what do you recommend to people who are having these kinds of issues, or do they just not apply? Ms. Hudson. Yes, um, what we do now is, uh, you know, rely on uh, the process that we have online and the forms being there and being able to connect in um, through online in terms of uh, looking at those forms, getting the forms where we want to go and what our plans are, are to work, first of all, two points, first of all, to work better with court services staff. Court services staff are in the courthouses, so they have a client point of contact, and we have court services staff and maintenance enforcement staff that have the same clients. Payers and recipients are in the courthouse with respect to getting their order or varying their order, and they are our clients if they enroll. So looking at working better with our court services staff to assist people in, do you want to enroll in the maintenance enforcement program and let me help you with that? We are also looking at a navigator position um, to assist those people in terms of reaching out, as I said earlier, sometimes even calling back, not just saying here are the forms or go on the website and get the forms, but um, noting that when people have um, called in or emailed in a question and requested forms, actually having a person call them back, a navigator, and saying, did you receive the forms? Did you get the forms? Can I help you with the forms? Okay, um, a, a quick one um, with that. Um, do you ever have people who come off the come out of the program? I know women who've been sort of strong-eyed, armed by their exes, who have gone to direct payment, and then have found that their 
former partner is not making payments, you know, especially when it comes to like school, um, back to school expenses and things that they sort of sometimes split um, expenses that aren't a regular occurrence. So um, is it easy for them to get back on as a client? Ms. Hudson. Yes, and I would uh, ask uh, Ms. Sparling to uh, provide some specifics. You can come back, and uh, we try to uh, make it as easy as possible. Ms. Sparling. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, um, I hear what you're saying, and uh, it's a very, uh, when you want to withdraw from our program, that is one of the um, factors that is um, brought to be is that a uh, if a recipient saying, I would like to withdraw from your program, it's not as simple as that. Um, both part, because I do recognize uh, what it is that you're making reference to, and I would, uh, domestic violence is a high priority to ensure that um, all people are safe, and I would not want a recipient to feel that they are being kind of forced into requesting to withdraw from the program by a payer. Payer would also have to sign this form, a recipient would have to sign, but uh, we would have to be ensured we would have to be um, ensured that the payment arrangement in future is what is it? What is your arrangement to make these payments? And they are to be made, and it, the payer would be, uh, rec would be uh, directed to do that, and we would have to know what that arrangement is. Is it by uh, direct payment? Is it by check and what have you? And ensure that the recipient knows that they can re-enroll at any time very easily without any uh, judgment or roadblocks. Okay, thank you. I'll pass on to my colleague, Mr. McGuire. Mr. McGuire. Thank you for being here today. I just, I have a few questions and I just ask that we have short, quick, direct answers, please. So a lot of people that I deal with uh, have uh, become extremely frustrated with the maintenance forced program. Uh, they're dealing with years and years of non-payments. Uh, their experience and some of our experience in our office is that uh, phone calls are not being returned to those clients, they're not being returned in a timely manner. And, you know, we, we, what do you say to those clients that have given up um, and how much of that $58.8 million, and I can, I can give you a whole list of individuals that I know that have said, you know what, uh, I'm not even going to bother anymore. I've been going through the system for so long. Um, you know, that's a lot of money that can change a lot of children's lives and feed a lot of people. And uh, how much of that money, uh, so it's a two-part question, how much of that money uh, is money that people just saying, you know what, I'm, I'm not even going to bother trying to collect anymore. I've been doing this for years. Ms. Hudson. Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, with respect to uh, the first uh, question regarding uh, phone calls, uh, we now have uh, timelines to ensure that uh, phone call inquiries or complaints are returned. That is something new for us, and uh, we do expect, and it has been um, identified also by the Auditor General. So, so what's the timeline? So if yes. I make a call tomorrow and say my partner isn't paying, what's the timeline yes. for a return call? Two to three days. Two to three days? Yes. And the resolution of that? So a phone call is great, like we're reaching out and saying, yes, we, we realize you've contacted us. And that's great, but that's still not putting money in the pockets of the people that yes. need it. So how long until that case file is resolved? Do we have timelines? In terms of uh, looking at what enforcement action should be taken and explaining that enforcement action, we are asking in terms of the inquiry that that is what is communicated to uh, the uh, recipient if they, for example, were the ones calling in. So it's not just a timeline in terms of a... Uh, you know, you get back to somebody, yes, I've heard your issue, thank you, uh, we're working on it. It is about what is the next step, what can be done. Now, there are different timelines with respect to what can be done. Putting a garnishment on if uh, the person has a yeah, source of income that is like from the federal government, for example, is easier than doing another enforcement action further along. So there are specific uh, timelines, but... What we have our eye on now, and because of the Auditor General's recommendations, is looking at uh, ensuring that the supervisors have their eye on are the right enforcement actions proceeding and that we don't have these long time delays. So, so and, and then we'll get to the second part of the question, but are you actively reaching out to people that have uh, been in the system for years, weeks, days, months, years, and have not received any type of payment and maybe have not reached out to your department because they've given up. So that's a big part of this is, is people that have lost faith in the maintenance enforcement system. Um, are you actively reaching out to them to 
to uh, give them the proper tools or to encourage them in the right direction to get the money that they deserve. Ms. Hudson. Thank you. Um, yes, I believe that your question is around the inactive cases, and the um, the inactive cases are those in which there is no enforcement action. Where we have uh, not been where we want to be in the past is that we have not monitored those and reached out to uh, the payers, the recipients, on a regular, consistent basis. We now have a process of when cases need to be reviewed, and we are refining that so that a case just doesn't sit there with with nothing being done and never being checked on uh, for years. And I appreciate you've only been in this role for a couple of years and uh, the Auditor General, we thank him for taking on this very important topic, but why did it take an Auditor General's report to say that uh, there are people out there that are not receiving the proper maintenance enforcement and, and why now, why not two years ago, five years ago, ten years ago? Ms. Hudson. Certainly, uh, the importance of the maintenance enforcement program has been on the radar of this government for the last three years. Um, when I came into uh, my role uh, just two years ago, um, it was a high priority for me. Changes were made. We were coming off of the 2015 review and implementing that review. That 2015 review had 27 recommendations. 25 of those have been implemented. The only two that were not implemented and are going to now be implemented in this year were with respect to internet technology. So that what we have, uh, Mr. McGuire, is a situation where, um, uh, you know, certainly uh, what I hear you asking is, you know, why did it take you or, uh, so long? I'm, I'm sorry, the time has expired. Um, the, uh, we'll move to the PC caucus, Mr. Chris Dontermont. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is going to be interesting, but I'll, I'll maybe I'll let them get back to it when they when it's their turn. Um, so, according to the 2017-18 accountability report, 45% of cases are in full uh, compliance, and I appreciate this has improved over time. But with more than half the cases having arrears, is concerning. I think uh, that many who don't encounter uh, MEP uh, would be surprised that full compliance is so low. Uh, what factors lead to such low compliance? Ms. Hudson. I will begin and ask uh, Mr. Feindel to follow up. Um, with respect to uh, 45 cases in uh, full compliance, um, I believe we're up to uh, you know a little bit above that now uh, in this quarter. Um, with respect to your question, um, yes, we do have our eye on uh, continuous improvement and getting that up even more. We do. Um, stack up favorably with respect to other jurisdictions' maintenance enforcement programs regarding the amount of cases in compliance and full compliance and regarding the amount of money flowing over uh, into recipients' hands. Part of the issue is that uh, there are uh, a segment of the cases that are inactive cases. Of the outstanding arrears that uh, were from the last fiscal year that have accumulated over uh, the course of uh, uh, 22 years of the program, of uh, $60 million last fiscal year, um, approximately uh, um, $14 million of that was uh, with respect to uh, inactive arrears, 12, 13, 14 million inactive arrears. So those, uh, you know, that that has to be factored in, in terms of understanding why, and what I hear your question is, why only 45% of cases are in full compliance. A portion of those cases are payers that cannot be located, and we have um, used our public safety unit now um, within the Department of Justice, and the maintenance enforcement program can make a referral to our public safety division to try to track down payers when we cannot find the payer through the maintenance enforcement program when somebody's been gone underground. So when we're trying to locate them or when a recipient has maybe given information that uh, um, uh, I think that uh, he's working and uh, I think that he's working under the table. So in terms of looking at moving cases out of an inactive status, we've done better on that and I've talked about that. I do wish you to know that we are also utilizing our public safety division to do investigations, but part of of the understanding of the 45, now 46% of our cases in full compliance is also looking at the inactive arrears and also looking at issues uh, um, of complexity of certain cases um, where there are 
situations where a payor or a recipient should actually be going back to court to vary the order. So for example, if uh, arrears might be continuing to tally up on an order um, and uh, um, say the children have uh, aged out, those arrears keep tallying up until the order is varied. 12. Okay, sorry. Mr. Don Tremont. Okay, that, uh, thank you. I'm just wondering how much time we had on this one. It was 12 minute rounds. 12 minutes. Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, so, according to the 1718 Accountability Report, 64% or a shade under two thirds of cases are seeing monthly compliance. So that means that 64% are making their required payments while 36 are falling into arrears or some sort of degree or another. Uh, is, is that kind of, am I seeing that number correctly that way? Ms. Hudson. Yes. All right, so 39% are reduced to that, reducing their arrears, 36 are increasing their arrears, which leaves about 25%, making their full monthly payment only. Of these 25%, are they relatively low maintenance accounts, or do they require a lot of attention? Mr. Feindel. The 25% uh, the would uh, often involve cases like uh, a high, high degree of arrears that are quite often in place for a long time and uh, perhaps more difficult to. So the further up the uh, enforcement continuum we get, there is more time and uh, tension uh, needed and given to those files, but they also take more time to. And uh, as the deputy has mentioned, we've got some initiatives underway trying to, in some cases, uh, encourage the um, uh, re-looking at the court orders themselves to make sure that they reflect uh, accurately the ability of the payer to pay and therefore that we have an accurate picture of the arrears that are owing. So uh, lots of, uh, you know, this is a complex business uh, trying to deal with the variety of cases that we get. Uh, the numbers are very much what drives uh, the program. So we pay attention to uh, the, the types of, uh, of files that, uh, that need the, the increased amounts of attention. You mentioned the, the 45% uh, and it's actually 46% recently, um, under 50% doesn't really leave a good impression. So we've actually uh, flipped that around as a target for this year that we want to get, instead of 45, 55, we want 55% in compliance to drive activities, uh, you know, from the team and working with our payers uh, to get that into a better place. All right, so we were talking about uh, arrears and non-compliance for 22 years, so we're starting to add up the dollar. So uh, the question, you know, when, when do we determine a payment is unrecoverable? And I, and I know this money belongs to children and, fa and families, but at what point do we, do we write it off? I mean, in the 22 years ago, if there's still stuff that's owed back then, you know, what, what, is, the, what is our limit on this stuff? Ms. Hudson. Thank you. Um, I will say that there is a provision within the uh, um, policies and the act for uh, the director of maintenance enforcement to uh, basically determine that a case is going to no longer have enforcement action. Okay. And uh, that can uh, be triggered, uh, for example, uh, when the, um, all ability to uh, locate a payor or determine income of the payor or to find a recipient. Sometimes the recipients can't be found in certain cases that those um, um, undertakings have been undertaken and with no further information. And then a decision can be made at the director level um, that uh, no further action is going to be taken. However, um, part of the arrears is the problem is, is that the arrears are still uh, calculating and accumulating and so they are uh, on enforceable arrears, if you will, or false arrears, um, and, but we do have our eye on looking at what has been done to find the payor or the recipient, to find an income source and uh, to flow that money through, and then um, the director, if that uh, comes to naught, the director, only the director, as I understand it, and I stand to be corrected, um, can make uh, that decision uh, to uh, no longer do any enforcement action. Mr. Feindel. Yeah, what I would add there uh, is that the, um, the 
greatest amount of effort possible is put into making sure that the payments are collected and that we do have uh, enforcement of the court order so we don't give up. Um, if we do determine, as the deputy has pointed out, that it's, it's um, a situation where we really can't enforce, um, we, uh, we do look at that. However, in the majority of cases, some of these ones that perhaps you're uh, sometimes hearing about are, are ones that we have been working on a long time and things like we might have a lien on a property and it takes takes a while for that property to, if it's sold, to uh, to accrue any payments to the uh, to the recipient. Um, we have the ability to garnish lottery winnings, so that's a timing factor. I've I've observed in the time that I've been with the program that you know when those come through, those are opportunities for us to deal with some of those cases where there haven't been income sources for quite some time. So um, it does require patients uh, sometimes to identify where the money, if the payer doesn't have the the income, does not have the assets, then there's limited amounts we can do, but sometimes that's, a ma that's monitoring, uh, rechecking, uh, constantly trying to pursue the options that we have available to us uh, in the Act for enforcement uh, before that, uh, that money can actually be recovered for the recipient. And I'm sure there's cases where, I mean, over 22 years, uh, people have passed on, estates have been probated, uh, you know, there's really no access to that payer, and of course families have, have changed over 22 years, so um, I just find it interesting that we still calculate some of those those numbers, and we've, we've moved on so far. Um, there was a 2015 client survey, it wasn't a great survey, 12% uh, were satisfied or very satisfied with enforcement. Um, are you planning on doing a survey again and uh, what would it look like? Ms. Hudson. I will uh, turn that over to Mr. Feindel because uh, I asked that question myself very recently. So as I've said, just as a precursor or introduction to his comments, um, we have, within the um, context of our increasing the accessibility and uh, um, usability of our IT side, had a very specific intentional focus on reaching out to clients. From that conversation and keeping our eye on the metrics, because I do like metrics um, and it's a road map forward. Um, I did ask the same question that you've asked so I'd ask if Mr. Feindel can answer that. Mr. Feindel. Yes, yeah, so um, we've uh, currently got some work underway doing client consultation as part of building new online service, um, and that's reaching out uh, proactively to clients in our uh, client base uh, to get their feedback, not only on things that they might like to see in an online service, but uh, their experiences with the program, and it's uh, giving us some insights that are necessary. We have uh, a client consultation group that was formed as part of that work in 2015, and and uh, our manager of organizational development has included in, in her role uh, to uh, continue to uh, manage and consult with that group um, in terms of obtaining feedback. And um, my plans would be that we would also introduce a client survey uh, kind of activity during our enrollment process and also as part of our enforcement activities. And certainly uh, things like people not choosing to enroll or not or withdrawing from the program, understanding why that's happened and seeing what we can do uh, to address that feedback. Okay, thank you. And I would be remiss if I didn't ask this question uh, on uh, the first day of, of cannabis sales in this province. And I have the Minister of Justice, uh, Deputy Minister of Justice in front of me. Um, have the regulations been complete? Are they, have they been submitted? Um, what's the policy on random roadside checks? And is there anything you can share with us quickly? Ms. Hudson. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, we are in good shape in uh, Nova Scotia uh, for today. It is uh, perhaps I would say uh, the biggest uh, you know social policy change in Canada um, um, in uh, in decades. I've said uh, you know since uh, you know Medicare came about and uh, Tommy Douglas had a good idea. So uh, this was uh, you know. I'm sorry, time has oh. expired. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to hear it too, but uh, we'll move to the NDP caucus and the Honourable Dave Wilson. I shouldn't have told him I was going to ask about <laughs> cannabis was my first question since the minister or deputy minister is here. I definitely let you finish that question if you uh, or I can ask you another one on it. It's it's really the it kind of the same is is your department and is the province prepared for uh, the legalization of cannabis today? Ms. Hudson. Yes, uh, thank you. Um, 
We are ready. It has been a very significant uh, undertaking uh, for the uh, Department of Justice, working with all other government departments, um, working with uh, Nova Scotians, and uh, um, it has been a very interesting and challenging timeline. The federal government set the timeline, and every province and territory had to respond. You have seen uh, from the news uh, recently that uh, um, Nova Scotia, compared to some other provinces and territories, uh, Nova Scotia is in a good position relative to where some other provinces and territories are. For example, uh, British Columbia, I think, has uh, one retail location um, set up, and uh, Nova Scotia has its retail environment set up, uh, has its online environment set up, um, has its uh, focus in terms of uh, the police training and uh, the resources regarding um, impaired driving, um, has uh, invested significantly into uh, communication efforts for Nova Scotia and uh, the uh, um, communication um, strategy um, has been uh, noted to be uh, you know one of the most uh, fulsome across Canada compared to other jurisdictions so the government of Nova Scotia has invested uh, dollars into a communication strategy I stand to be corrected uh, in terms of right now uh, ie at this point in time uh, this uh, this fiscal year of uh, four hundred thousand dollars into a uh, provincial strategy strategy of communication, focusing on um, having uh, the health and safety of Nova Scotians at the forefront, uh, focusing on, uh, so the communication strategy uh, flows from issues about how to talk to children, what are the things to uh, know in terms of going uh, slow, um, in terms of cannabis, and uh, also impaired driving. So re relative to our retail environment, relative to uh, the complexities and the challenging timeline, um, relative to comparing ourselves to other, other jurisdictions, um, and uh, focusing also on communication with Nova Scotians, uh, I think that we are in good shape. Great. Thank you uh, for that. I was going to ask you uh, the budget, uh, how much is being spent, so I appreciate uh, the information you, you've, uh, you've given us. Um, so have you worked with uh, the Department of Education, Department of Health, uh, around uh, around the public education campaign, uh, especially geared towards youth? Because I know that's, I think, uh, the discussion about legalizing it or not is over. Uh, I think a lot of the attention now is turned to making sure, and all the evidence show how, you know, the use of cannabis at an early age has a huge impact, and a negative impact on, on our young. So uh, for me, uh, I want to make sure that we're doing everything we can to make sure that those young people understand uh, the ramifications of, of maybe doing cannabis at an early age. So are you working with the Department of Health and the Department of Education to make sure that that campaign, that development of public awareness is, is something that is done, is it done? And, and if not, when will that be fit, finalized so that you know, our teachers, our health, uh, health uh, staff around the province can make sure that they're educating young people on the impacts of this? Ms. Hudson. Thank you. Um, yes, we have been and we will continue to work uh, very closely with the uh, Department of Health and Education specific to uh, your question on those two government departments and with respect to uh, communication out to Nova Scotians. As one example, um, a letter uh, was uh, developed and uh, was sent to uh, um, all parents of uh, school-aged children in the September of this year with respect to what uh, um, uh, parents should have on their radar regarding uh, issues of cannabis and young people. Our communication strategy has also focused on protecting youth and ensuring that all Nova Scotians know what are the rules and what are the concerns and issues that they should keep the front of mind. So uh, the uh, communication strategy has had a big element with respect to youth, uh, i.e., you may have seen some of these ads, how to talk to your children, how to uh, raise the subject or answer their questions. It has also had the second focus on impaired driving and safety on the roads. Regarding um, how we have worked with health and education and other departments in terms of protecting youth in our retail environment, as you know that uh, we have a retail environment where uh, if you are under the age of 19, you cannot go into the retail store and uh, um, see the cannabis products or purchase the cannabis products. And on our Nova Scotia online retail e-commerce site from um, Nova Scotia Liquor Corporation, you cannot go on to the site unless you have have uh, your age verified before and uh, Nova Scotia is uh, you know um 
one of only a few provinces that have added extra protections into their e-commerce site to ensure that uh, um, only people of the age of majority for legal cannabis consumption can actually uh, see the products and make an online uh, purchase. I mean, uh, we, we, we kept keep our heads in the sand, uh, especially around the limits. I mean, someone can go purchase 30 grams. I mean, I don't know if someone can smoke 30 grams in, in a sitting, but uh, I doubt it. So my concern is, is the, uh, the, uh, the ability for young people maybe to get someone who's av of age to get that. Uh, final kind of question on this. Uh, I know uh, during the session uh, there was a number of questions geared towards the, de uh, towards the minister uh, around the cost uh, of, of the changes, especially around law enforcement. And one of the questions, and I don't think we got an answer, was around uh, our municipalities uh, will they have the ability to recoup, recoup some of that cost, especially around policing and, and law enforcement, because there is going to be an increase in, in, in law enforcement. I mean, I've talked to my own uh, people who are, who are doing it in my community, it's the RCMP, but there are, going to, there are going to be increases. So is there an ability for those municipalities over the next, uh, within this fiscal year to say, listen, you know, we are seeing pressures, you know, uh, is, the, is the government prepared to address some of those pressures and are we as a government getting that fund from the federal government? Because this was kind of shoved down the, uh, the, uh, the jurisdictions of the provinces uh, because of a federal change. So uh, I know there's a couple questions in there, but I'm just wondering if, if you could comment yes. on that. Um, so thank you. I will uh, attempt to go uh, backwards uh, with respect to uh, um, the multiple prongs of your question, and I hope I get all of those. With respect to uh, the impaired driving situation in Nova Scotia and our ability uh, to enforce and uh, therefore promote safety and security on our roads, Nova Scotia is in um, good shape compared to other jurisdictions regarding the uh, number of drug recognition experts that we have in our 10 municipal police and the RCMP across Nova Scotia. So we have, I believe right now, 61 uh, drug recognition experts and we also have training for um, um, uh, the SFSD uh, um, officers. Compared to other jurisdictions, we have a higher ratio of police trained as drug recognition experts than others. So we are in a good shape and uh, Chief McIsaac, I believe, uh, from Cape Breton Regional Police uh, just made that comment uh, within the last day and it's not the first time that he's made it. Um, with respect to the federal government, uh, the federal government, it is, uh, you know, these are challenging timelines and the federal government is going to be supporting provinces and territories. With respect to providing uh, funding for training um, of, of SFSD and DRE. So what I mean by that is the federal government is providing money to provinces and territories in terms of ensuring that we have adequate trainers in each province and territory to train other frontline police with respect to how to recognize and enforce impaired driving laws. The money has not yet flowed to the provinces and territories, but the indications uh, have come out in the last uh, very little while regarding uh, that the money will soon flow and we do expect to have those positions uh, in place um, very soon and work has been underway. So there's been uh, you know a lot of communication back to the federal government with respect to uh, what will be the envelopes uh, for each province and territory, what is the focus of this uh, uh, federal money coming forward uh, uh, with respect to impaired driving. And uh, we've had indication that the money is uh, soon going to flow. Um, with respect to uh, the ability of uh, police to respond to a changed environment in terms of uh, cannabis is legal, legal rec recreationally as of today, um, there is, you know, um, an increased ability for uh, police to be able to respond in terms of um, the simple possession charges that were illegal yesterday um, are no longer going to be illegal today. So, uh, um, you know, the environment has changed with, you know, some things have come off the radar and now other things will be coming on the radar. So, uh, in terms of what it is going to actually cost uh, the province and municipalities, this is a changing and fluid environment and uh, we we are learning as we go and uh, almost day by day, but uh, do not think that uh, there has not been significant work and there will continue to be. 
Yeah, one of the area, one of the groups of individuals who we I've heard from is is those who use medical uh, the use of marijuana for medical use. Uh, bit of a concern. I know I only have a little bit of time here. Is uh, with the closures of some of the spots that they used mm -hmm. to get it, um, a lot of the attention was to go online, get it through the mail. There's a possible postal strike. Uh, is there any work being done on how to address individuals who access medical marijuana who might not be able to get to one of the 12 uh, stores? So uh, um, two things, uh, first of all, in terms of if you have a prescription for medical marijuana, that is regulated uh, solely by um, the federal government, by Health Canada. The only way to uh, receive your supply of medical marijuana if you have a prescription is that uh, it would come to you online, or you can grow it yourself, or you can get a license for someone else to grow it for you. You cannot go into a dispensary and receive medical marijuana. That is illegal. It has been. It continues to be. There has been some misperception within uh, the uh, citizens across Canada about the uh, legality or illegality of dispensaries. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We will. Uh, you had a few more seconds. We'll move to the Liberal Caucus and uh, Mr. Gordon Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I'll bring us back to the topic at hand, if you don't mind. I, I do say, though, that you um, you certainly have a good grasp of the of the subject matter, and uh, and not only on the cannabis side, but certainly on the maintenance enforcement. And uh, I, I always want to. It's 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 usually humbling when you sit here and hear of all the. Um, intricacies within a department, especially something like maintenance enforcement that is not only legal, but it's complicated, it's uh, uh, very emotional, um, it's people at risk. It's, it's, it's probably one of the most challenging places, I think, in government, and I, I have to say that, that uh, our focus is on your staff. You've heard some questions, and I certainly want to commend them for being in probably one of the most challenging jobs that there is and thank them. Um, I just have a couple questions and then obviously when we're at the very end of the questioning we run out of, we've heard a lot of the answers so I'll try to be uh, in areas that weren't touched already. <laughs> One right off the bat was, what is a black belt in Lean Six Sigma? <laughs> I, I, nobody else asked but I am very curious uh, in your opening statement. Ms. Hudson. Yes, thank you, and I will uh, actually ask uh, Mr. Feindell to uh, fill in the blanks on this. But this is about uh, a black belt in Lean Six Sigma. Um, sounds very interesting. It was interesting when I heard about this uh, a couple of years ago. We are very lucky to have uh, within our maintenance enforcement program in New Waterford uh, this person, um, Kendra Grant. Um, she comes from um, private sector experience. What it means, from my understanding, because I've asked that myself is that this is a person who has a, a very clear, efficient, and effective lens. So that's her, her, she's focused on the two E's in my thinking, the efficiency and the effectiveness of business processes, looking at how we can, what we do in our processes, how they can be made more efficient and more effective. So that is my, the way in which, you know, I say what is a Lean Six Sigma black belt. She is um, the manager of operational programs uh, for um, the maintenance enforcement program. So she looks at the efficiency and the effectiveness. She has made changes regarding um, the way in which uh, we interact with clients, how we should train our staff, and how we should change our processes. So those are, those, those are the three prongs. Uh, Mr. Feindell may uh, wish to add something. Mr. Feindell. Yes, yeah, just very briefly, Lean Six Sigma is an industry, uh, cross-industry standard for process improvement, continuous improvement, and there's several certifications within that program, if you will. Government's been very um, proactive in developing those skills, and so there's white belt, yellow belt, green belt, and black belt, and black belt is the highest level of, of, of certification within that Lean Six Sigma program, so we are very lucky to have that level of expertise uh, within maintenance enforcement. Okay. Thank you. Back to the topic at hand, the, uh, the, and I am curious with the Auditor General here, I, I hadn't heard too much asked about 
There were 27 recommendations. I'm more interested in follow-up and, and your communication back and forth with the Auditor General, and uh, I think we as a committee would be interested in also knowing uh, the status of those 27 recommendations um, and the plans for how you are going to address them. I know that that could be a very lengthy document, but it would be, I think, very fruitful for us to request that if possible, and I'd like to hear how you uh, interact with the AG in that regards. Ms. Hudson. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd ask that Mr. Feindel also uh, speak with respect to this. Uh, the 27 recommendations from uh, the 2015 review port report um, um, have been addressed as, and that was a roadmap. And as I said before, I do believe in having a plan um, and, uh, you know, um, uh, what is the poem of the best laid plans of mice and men often go awry? I do understand that, but I do like to have a plan. Um, and the, a review report gives us a plan. Then we had the Auditor General come in and say, what are the areas that are specifically continuing to be problematic? That too was welcomed in a good plan. Regarding the 2015 review report, we will uh, provide that to you. Um, we have uh, acted on um, all of the recommendations with respect to two. And as I uh, just, I touched on it earlier, the two that have remained outstanding are with respect to internet technology, and we do expect to have those operationalized uh, uh, by the end of this fiscal year. Um, they were about how we can use internet technology better to give information, and how we can make our client base aware of um, the uh, maintenance enforcement program and how to access and get information. So those two will be acted on. Regarding uh, how we discussed it with um, the auditor General, and during the time when uh, he was in, starting in uh, uh, 2015 and focusing mainly on 2016 and 17, I would ask Mr. Feindel to discuss that specifically. Mr. Feindel. Yeah, so the um, report that came out from our client consultation group in 2015 uh, was already in hand before the Auditor General came in with their six recommendations uh, this past year. And um, those had been worked on uh, over the la course of the last two years, and the final two, as referenced by the Deputy, have been outstanding just because of the uh, need to move forward with technology changes to enable those. And it's around notification to payers and recipients that uh, one of the recommendations recommendations and the other one is around uh, the awareness on the uh, the MEP online and it at the moment uh, with the you know the inability for clients to get in with tablets and mobile devices uh, doesn't make a lot of sense to go and push folks uh, to use the online system if they can't get in so we're fixing that this year and in, in early 2019 we'll be in a position to kind of wrap up that 27 recommendations okay thank you I'll turn my questions over to my honorable member Mr. McKay. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, thank you. This has been a very informative session, um, and I wish you all the best with the improvements that you're embarking on. Um, I'm going to come back to some metrics. Um, I believe that uh, there's currently about 60 million, 58 and change uh, owed to recipients, uh, and uh, did I hear correctly that that's down from 73 million some time ago? So that's about a 20 percent, roughly 20 percent decrease. Um, what would you judge to be a realistic target in those sorts of terms of millions of dollars as far as outstanding payments owed to recipients? Ms. Hudson. Yes, I would uh, begin, Mr. Chair, and ask uh, Mr. Feindel to continue on. In terms of, of uh, realistic and where we would like to be, those are two uh, different things. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of being realistic, I would, uh, you know, say that uh, from the just to take rough figures, um, $60 million is now at $58.8 million in terms of the arrears that have accumulated since 1996. Um, but that we do know that there is a significant portion of those that would have to be backed out, that those are the unenforceable arrears or false arrears, if you would, um, uh, payors or recipients that uh, um, uh, either can't be located or have no ability to pay or that the dependency no longer exists if we're talking about children. So that would have to be... Uh, 
um, backed out of an understanding about the um, what would be a realistic figure. So if you backed out that uh, 14 million out of that, and you know you're, then you're getting down to into uh, the uh, um, you know the 40s, um, then looking at what are the complexities of still needing to know that sometimes enforcement action takes a really long time when mm. uh, perhaps there have been arrears that have accumulated and the uh, only ability um, to enforce those arrears might be a lien. And as Mr. Feindel spoke about, sometimes it takes a long time uh, for that situation to come to pass. Um, you know, I can't uh, sit here and give you a specific figure, but uh, in terms of what would be a realistic amount to get down to, but I can say this, uh, uh, you know, I am... Uh, I, I do get impatient in my old age, and uh, um, I do know that uh, um, I have great people around me that are very passionate and knowledgeable about what they do. So that combination of my impatience and their knowledge uh, will get us to a uh, better position regarding um, the uh, um, and arrears that are outstanding. I don't want to commit to what I think would be a good amount to say our outstanding arrears in terms of a realistic amount, but it would uh, certainly we would have to uh, decrease or subtract out those arrears that are false or unenforceable. Mr. McKay? Was Mr. Feindel making comments to that, following on that? Mr. Feindel? If not, I'll proceed. Yeah, uh, the only thing I would quickly add is that, you know, um, as the deputy has pointed out around those unenforceable arrears, we are looking, uh, we've reduced down 7.2% uh, since March of this year with, so that's a pretty good result for the team uh, to be focusing on the arrears. We're also, uh, the, re the arrears is really an indicator. Um, what we really want to focus on is getting payments in the hands of recipients. And if we're doing that better and we're doing that well, the arrears will come down. Um, around $10 million of that arrears has been in place since the program was created. So all of those factors come into play that as we get that number down, it gets tougher and tougher to kind of uh, um, uh, resolve uh, those situations, but we constantly look at ways that we can attack even those older files, even the ones that have been around to have strategies to try and figure out how we can collect the, the money owing to recipients. Okay. I, um I think I understand the cumulative effect of arrears, uh, but just coming back to the outstanding payments, uh, you know, we've got some hard numbers there, 73 to 60. Um, I think if uh, if I or we as the Public Accounts Committee are going to assess the performance of the uh, of the program, the maintenance, enfor uh, maintenance enforcement program, it would be very good certainly to know if there's a, a, a target, a goal to be a range of under 50 million, under 25 million, under 5 million. It's very difficult for us to assess uh, the effectiveness of your program. Uh, that's what we're here for, uh, to ask those tough questions and, and to hold your feet to the fire, quite frankly. Um, so I, I would certainly like to know a target. Um, I don't think I'm going to get the answer. I, I agree with you. We'd all ideally like it to be zero, but that's not realistic. Uh, but I would certainly like to uh, to hear a. The, it's just uh, the ten week seconds remaining. Under. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Over to you. <laughs> We'll be working on ways that we can identify lowering that arrears to the minimum amount possible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for their questions. Thank you to our witnesses for their answers. And uh, Ms. Hudson, I'll give you an opportunity to provide some closing comments now. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, strengthened our legislation. We have strengthened our staff complement and strengthened our staff training. We are seeing better outcomes. The legislative uh, uh, changes combined with the increased staff, five last year, combined with more clarity about how to do their job, combined with a commitment to, to a client-first approach, combined with uh, $1.2 million this fiscal year in IT improvements, combined with a new energy of our staff on the front lines in New Waterford, and I commend our staff, and in particular, uh, Kathy Sparling and Stephen Feindel, uh, with respect to making that change happen. Combined with the roadmap provided by the Auditor General, 
and combined with the fact that uh, um, the Department of Justice has a good track record in terms of following up on Auditor General recommendations. I think that uh, we are in a good position and uh, as much as anything can be in a situation such as this where we are talking about uh, um, payers and recipients and often in very challenging circumstances that we are on the path to a good situation and even greater improvements in the future. The approach is commitment and clarity to end in terms of the maintenance enforcement program. And I would like to end by just uh, ending with actually the words of the Auditor General because he did in his report uh, commend the maintenance enforcement program. And at the uh, end of that uh, report of the Auditor General, and I just want to end with uh, two quotes from the Auditor General because I think that they sum up well um, that work was underway when the Auditor General began his report. And we are very committed to following through and continuing and building on the, uh, the gains made. And those uh, quotes are two. They come from uh, page uh, 63 and uh, uh, paragraph 3.34 and 3.37 of the Auditor General's report. The Auditor General says this, quote, management set goals for the program as part of the Department of Justice's annual business planning process. They improved the goals by including measurable performance indicators. Examples are provided below. I'm going to end the quote there. The final quote from the Auditor General is this, quote, even though there are issues with monitoring and enforcing court orders, we found that management is making informed decisions to try and improve the program's performance. As many of these initiatives are recent, we did not see changes in our testing results. We encourage management to continue to monitor performance and make changes as necessary. End of quote. I thank the Auditor General. I thank you for today. And uh, um, you have our commitment that our priority focus and energy is going to be on this program. Thank you very much. We do have some committee business. I'll allow our witnesses to exit if they wish. Um, we have correspondence uh, that I believe everyone has received from Department of Business. Uh, information requested from the June 6, 2018 meeting. Uh, from the Auditor General, um, his 2017-18 uh, performance report and business plan, and also from the Department of Seniors, Seniors, which was information requested from the May 16th meeting. Any questions on that correspondence? Okay. Um, the next item is, uh, is two items. One is subcommittee on agenda and procedures, future meetings, and also uh, scheduling of future meetings, clarification of issues. Uh, these issues are raised by the committee clerk uh, based on the motion that was recently passed to change the way we choose our witnesses. Uh, Ms. Langell, could you um, perhaps run through uh, some of the issues you've encountered with trying to schedule meetings? Ms. Landry. Um, yes, um, I do have a couple things that it would be helpful um, if I had sort of clarification on and uh, that might make my life easier uh, based on the exact wording of the motion. And it really goes to um, scheduling of reports. Um, the first one is scheduling of reports and chapters in the order that they are in the report, um, which makes sense, but it does prove difficult for me um, as an example, if the first chapter witness isn't available, the next meetings can't be set up until that is booked. So I just wanted to, if, if that's the intent, that's fine. But I just wanted to highlight that issue and if there's any, I guess, room for um, some flexibility on my part in that regard or not. I guess that's one concern that I had. I don't know if okay. we wanted to address them kind of by, by as we go we, along. I think one by one would okay. be best. Uh, we'll move to the gentleman that moved the motion, Gordon Wilson. Thank you. I didn't know if others wanted to speak first on it, but I, I think it's a very valid point. It wasn't intended uh, to that, and I don't think um, there's any objection. And I believe I spoke briefly with a couple other committee members uh, on this. And if we have flexibility there by all means. If we can meet that order, I think for a matter of preparing mm -hmm. um, for our researchers and that, it would be helpful. But if we can't, that's certainly a... Okay. Mr. Dontremont and then Ms. Lonis Croft. 
Sure, and, and I and, and I, I agree with my with my colleague here. Uh, it, it, if they're out of order, they're out of order. But at least we have the opportunity to have uh, those departments before us. And again, our concern has never been the order of, of, of the Auditor General's report. It's it's simply the opportunity for other topics to come before this committee. Thank you, Ms. Lonis Croft. And I don't think the intention was solely that we could only do one chapter at a time. If there, there are chapters where there's a lot of compliance and, and whatnot, we can combine, more, have more than one department in for a meeting. And I think there, we know by going over the reports, the ones that seem to have the most issues that we would like um, brought forward. But if we have some departments that are doing very well, um, we could probably combine a couple for one meeting. We've done that before. We've had different departments in. Okay, I think the consensus is that uh, that there's the committee is okay with providing the clerk flexibility in scheduling of, of the meetings. Uh, Ms. Roberts, I'm sorry, I didn't see that you wanted to make a comment as well. Well, um, well just to build off of um, the comment by Ms. Lonis Croft, um, I, I think that, yes, there, there is, um, you know, reason for flexibility and also, you know, Real potential for combining chapters, particularly when um, when different chapters touch on the work at, of the same department. However, I don't think it's fair to ask the clerk to make that decision or to do that analysis. And so maybe that becomes part of the job of the subcommittee is to group together topics and and to be looking ahead at you know wh where we're going, um, suggesting actual witnesses and and yeah, certainly. Um, that that seems like that that conversation is probably not a conversation we want to have as a whole committee, but that that would be appropriate to discuss at subcommittee, along with um, a, a number of the other points that the clerk raised. For example, um, you know wh who to call and what to call from the financial from the financial reports, where every chapter doesn't necessarily beg that witnesses be called. Um, and, and likewise, follow-up reports where we might want to select those departments that are having the, you know, l the least success in terms of compliance with um, with past audits. So I think all of that it would make sense to to work at at the subcommittee level, so that we're directing the clerk rather than asking her to, um, you know, wade through that stuff and make a bunch of discretionary calls. Okay, any other comments? Mr. Dontremont? Also in that, uh, that vein that we should have a subcommittee meeting sooner than later, so I don't know about next week, but the, at least before ne the week after that, uh, that we can all sit down and maybe discuss our way through the next uh, number of months of, uh, of meetings. Okay. Uh, we're kind of moving ahead in the agenda there. Those comments are certainly relevant. Um, so in terms of the first item addressed by the clerk, uh, is it agreed that the clerk will be given flexibility in terms of scheduling Auditor General Report chapter meetings? All those in favour signify by saying aye. aye. May not be appropriate for me to move that motion, but I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to uh, advance things. Uh, the next item is, uh, I'll let the clerk uh, speak to this, financial reports of the Auditor General. Well, uh, Ms. Roberts sort of touched on it um, with regard to uh, financial reports, follow-up reports, things such as that. Um, sometimes, um, like for example, the financial report, I think only one chapter often has recommendations, the other two are more um, talking about issues and they may address different departments. And as you pointed out, I don't really feel it's my place to say, well, okay, I think <laughs> these folks should come in. So um, you sort of touched on it and I think there was some agreement that that would be something that would be put forward to the subcommittee possibly to discuss those issues. Mr. Gordon Wilson. Yes, could I add one other thing also that I, I think would, would be beneficial for us is when the Auditor General comes in before us with that report to have the Deputy Minister at his side also to answer some questions and in doing that, that might help us even get further down into who uh, more appropriate, uh, unanswered questions usually is our, is our challenge that we have here, especially when we have the AG, so uh, I would suggest that that might be a, uh, a practice that we adopt for future ones to help us. Ms. Roberts, keep in mind we have about three minutes remaining. Yeah, so I, I would like to move that uh, the subcommittee 
identify specific topics and witnesses from financial reports and follow-up reports. Uh, the motion is, is, I think, intended to advance the discussion here. Um, Mr. Gordon Wilson. So, and I'll try to be brief on this because we do have just a few minutes. So, we have two things here. One is, is follow-up, and one in, which is in the five points that you had here. And if I could just say briefly, point four and five, I would definitely say, yeah, let's just continue following the same process that we have. But back to that, the follow-up, as I'd mentioned earlier that I'd like to have a subcommittee meeting to talk about how we address follow-up. How do we track? How do we, as a, as a committee, prioritize? How do we even know what we are lax on and what we're not? But at the same time, I think that committee meeting, that subcommittee meeting could be a very fruitful one also on, okay, what is our role now in selecting witnesses? How do we look at, you know, the financial reports? Uh, what about things that are outside of the AG reports that we might want to bring forward? What are the, what are the things, and I see my colleague being excited about that comment, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise, but truly I think that I'd like to see that meeting in preparation for that. I'd like to ask our clerk if she could look out and find how do other provinces actually do follow-up? I'm sure that we're not reinventing the wheel here. It would be nice to see a jurisdictional scan on that to give us some best examples of good cases and on agenda setting for things that are outside of the AG report. If, if we could have some of that work done in preparation, and finally the last thing, I think it's so important that we get our training done, and I know that there's uh, work going on uh, in selecting a leader, and there might be different people sitting here, but I, I would suggest that as early as possible in November, you know, as, as we can to get that training, because that all is foundational on our understanding on how to do these things. Uh, I, would, I would really appreciate that. Thank you. We've, we have run out of time. Um, I think uh, we, we did get one uh, piece of business concluded there, and I think the remainder will have to wait until uh, calling of uh, the subcommittee, the next subcommittee meeting, uh, which I expect will be soon. Any other business to come before the committee? Hearing none, this meeting is adjourned.